I wish that I could tell you I have lived my entire life without fear, but I can't. To this day, I still deal with a fear of heights. If there is any chance that I might fall, then I'm pretty uncomfortable. I suppose I've spent many years fearing failure as well. I never wanted to see an F on a test. I never wanted to miss a tackle. I'm still not very fond of needles, whether they are in the hands of a dentist or a doctor. And I struggle with the fear of food, especially when I am on a missions trip. I have found that if others are traveling with me on a trip overseas, that I can usually fake it and I can get by when I am served something that is challenging for me to eat. My problem comes when I'm traveling on my own. Like when I was sent out to the eastern edge of rural Poland and and I was teaching and then when the teaching time was over, we sat down to have a family meal together. And at that family meal, I was served a yellow gelatin that certainly wasn't jello. And embedded in that gelatin were the feet of chickens. Now, my host did not actually eat the chicken feet, but they they sort of gnawed on them for quite a while in the same way we might gnaw on a popsicle stick after the popsicle is long gone. For me, it is always better to be accompanied by adventurous eaters when I'm in a foreign country. And then there are the ever-present health issues that I'm dealing with and you're probably dealing with as well. Every medical professional I encounter responds to my condition in a similar way. They tell me, you're getting older. You're getting older and you're wearing that part of your body out. Now that is a real cause for concern. The other night I went to bed with a a whole entire head full of concerns. I had so many concerns that I could not sleep. Those concerns bombarded me from every side and my mind was processing them over and over and my heart was thumping faster and faster. Anxiety and sleep hardly ever mix for me. And even in my semi-conscious state, I could feel anxieties pushing their way to becoming all-out fears. The next morning, I decided after I arose that I would get up and I would write down every concern that was on my heart. By the time I finished, I thought to myself, well, that's actually not so bad. Certainly nothing that God can't handle. Now, you might be asking, why didn't I think of that before I tried to go to bed that evening? Or maybe you're thinking a bit deeper and you're wondering, why is fear such an issue for all of us? Well, I believe I know. And this is what I know. Fear didn't begin with me. When we were created, there was no fear. There was no fear in paradise. In paradise, humanity existed alongside God. Everything was provided for. God was good. He was especially good to his creation. After all, God, throughout all of that period of history, was in control. There was no need to worry about shelter. There was no need to worry about food or clean water. There wasn't even a need to worry about clothing. Life was perfect until man decided to exercise his own free will. The story in Genesis says the moment of impact came when man chose freely to ignore the will of God. At that point, paradise came to a screeching halt. And Genesis 3.10 says, for the first time, man looks out and speaks these words, I am afraid. I am afraid. Afraid. But afraid of what? Fear was something new. Fear before sin had never existed. And now fear was something to be reckoned with. And it would only grow and grow and grow throughout all of history. In fact, as man was cast out and barred from returning to the garden, his fears actually became very well-founded. He was cast out to find his own food, to produce his own clothing, cast out to deal with sickness and with death, cast out to make it on his own. Fleetwood Mac sang the song, Go Your Own Way. Now that sounds very appealing, doesn't it? Well, it may sound good in practice, but it presents all sorts of challenges. And the result of feeling those challenges is that now we are a people who can be described as fearful and anxious and panic stricken. We are a people who are full of dread. We are stressed and worried. We are confused. And many times we are just flat out apprehensive. We live in a world 
that is out of control. And we sense that we are losing the stability in our lives. Oh, we try, we try hard, we try hard to ensure that everything in our life is going to be okay. We take it all on our own shoulders. We bear those burdens because that's what grown-ups do. They are responsible. The problem is that along with Adam and Eve, we were barred from paradise, where the only one who could actually exert real control existed. Our free will has led us down the same path chosen by our most ancient ancestors. And now we are perceptive enough to realize that we can't handle what we face. Fear comes when we realize you and I don't have control. Fear comes when we realize just how out of control life actually is. Let's face it, we all need, we all desire stability in our lives. We need everything to be just so because we only know how to operate within those parameters. When life exists within our boundaries, we at least have the illusion of believing that we are in control, that we have the strength, that we have the wisdom, that we have the knowledge to handle this life as we know it. But when something upsets the order around us, we see our control threatened. We realize that our strength and our own wisdom may not be sufficient to see us through. And that's bad. That's bad because we run the risk of being found out. We run the risk of being found inadequate by those around us who are watching us, who are observing us. And that's when we sense our own helplessness. And this change causes us to begin to lose grip on the zone where we feel safe, where we feel comfortable, where things are actually predictable. Bob Dylan sang, the times, they are a changing. We know that's true, and we know for certain that the future, even the future of the very day in which we are living, is uncertain. So we feel out of control, and we begin to move and to live and to breathe in fear. Worse yet, when we choose to fear, we are giving demons permission to come and make real the nightmares that our anxiety has created. But like I said, fear didn't begin with me. However, I am wise enough to know that had I been the first man, it would have begun with me then. It would have been the same whether I was the first man or you were the first. I am not foolish enough to believe that I am stronger than Adam. The good news, though, and ultimately the good news that we have to embrace this morning is it doesn't really matter where fear began. It's like what C.S. Lewis was credited with saying. We can't rewrite our story, but we can choose the ending. What's happened has happened. But what happens next is still under our influence. If we can embrace this thought, we can begin to alleviate our own fears. We can begin to open our eyes to an entirely new reality. A reality that reveals that fear for the follower of Jesus has been constrained. For the very first announcement of the gospel in Luke chapter 2 verse 10 was very simply, don't be afraid. The first announcement, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Last week I mentioned that I love Jesus because he came. I love him because he came. Today I want to add that when he came, he dealt with my fear problems. I love Jesus because he enables me to overcome my fears. That's why Luke 2.10 is so special. From the time centered into, entered into our own lives until the coming of Jesus, more than 2,000 years had elapsed. 2,000 years for sin to reign supreme in this world. But when Jesus arrived, the very first thing that we hear is that we don't need to be afraid any longer. Oh, sure, I know the angels were trying to comfort some very startled shepherds. Startled shepherds who looked up into the night sky to see the stars and instead saw a whole host of angels. But their words also ushered in a new day and a new way for us to live. Don't be afraid. Of course, most of us probably need a little bit more assurance than that. 
a little bit more than just a few words from a lot of angels. So knowing how we are, Jesus provided for that need. Jesus met that need on our behalf. The proof is in the Gospels, the recorded history of the life and the ministry of Jesus. I would like to give you just one example, one explanation today that should put our fears into the proper context. Simply stated, Jesus controlled the sea. Psalm 65, 7 alludes to the coming of Jesus when it says, You quiet the raging oceans with their pounding waves. This is significant because to ancient people, the sea was chaotic. Its churning was unpredictable and the oceans were believed to be filled with all sorts of monsters as well as a host of demons. The bottom line was the sea always threatened death and death represented the ultimate in a lack of control. Today we are much more adept at taming the sea or so we think. Did you know that there are over 3 million shipwrecks on the bottom of the ocean floor? That doesn't even count the ones at the bottom of lakes and rivers. And did you know that each year 320,000 people across the world die from drowning? Some of that may be because of flooding. Over the past 20 years alone, 2.3 billion people have been affected by flooding disasters. So the sea still represents problems, doesn't it? The sea represents problems and threats. You could just ask the captain of the Ever Given who found a way to block the entire Suez Canal. And into this fear, this fear-inducing threat, stepped Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 4. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The original words in this text are of even greater impact than what I have just read to you. I have read that there was a fierce storm that came up, but initially Mark indicated the wind swept down on the sea with the force of a hurricane. And at the spoken words of Jesus, the wind completely stopped. The wind didn't lessen and eventually stop over time. They stopped when they were commanded by Jesus Christ to do so. I love Jesus because he alone has the power over nature. He alone can bring me to a true place of reassuring calm. He alone is worthy of my confidence. And one more thing, Jesus slept in the midst of this storm, this hurricane that was blowing over the Sea of Galilee. His ability to rest was a perfect lesson for those of us who are willing to put our confidence in our God. Such confidence is always well placed and it leads us as well to this rest and to this trust and to this time of peace. It delivers us from fear. But there's more. Luke chapter 5. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and we didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. At this time, their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Now it is simply amazing, but the same Jesus who had command over the forces of nature also has command over the fish of the sea. He has command over the animals of this land. He has command over the birds of the sky. It seems like the only thing that Jesus doesn't have command over is us. He has no command over us unless we choose to give him that authority. Now you may think that Jesus was a bit ahead of his time when he gave Simon the instruction to go back out and let those nets down again. 
You may think that he had a sophisticated fish finder with him and he knew exactly where the fish would be at that moment. My friend Ron has one of those on his boat. It doesn't seem fair to me. As we cruise out into the Gulf of Mexico, we can tell where the fish are and sometimes Ron can look at that range finder and he can tell me exactly what kind of fish are beneath the boat. And so when we find the fish, we drop our lines. I don't believe that's what happened on the Sea of Galilee. I believe that Jesus ordered the fish into those nets. They had to go into deeper water so more fish could be caught. That's because Jesus wanted the nets completely extended down to the bottom of the sea. And so many fish were caught that Peter's net broke, that he had to call for help from another boat. And both boats filled to the point of nearly sinking. And yet there's more. Matthew 14. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. While he sent the people home, they began their journey. And after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Now, night fell while he was there alone. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a, a wind had risen. And they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, for I am here. On this occasion, Jesus wasn't actually with the disciples in the boat. Instead, they knew him to be far away. They knew that Jesus was praying in the hills. But Jesus had yet another lesson on fear that he wanted to teach that day. So he made his way to the disciples by simply walking on the water. It was a great lesson. It was a lesson that I'm sure those men never, ever forgot. That Jesus is always with me, whether he is with me in spirit or in person, in actual body form, Jesus is always there. Yes, these men were distressed. In fact, this entire scene is a picture of human distress at its ultimate. The disciples were terrified, first of the great storm and then of the one who was walking on water. But they learned that the presence of Jesus alone can conquer our fears. That the presence of Jesus can give us hope and security. They learned that trusting Jesus leads us always to great encouragement. Well, we have seen now that fear is the first expression of humanity in rebellion against God. However, through Jesus we have been totally pardoned by God. And we have been made God's children. Now by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our thoughts, we bring our behavior into line with the truth and the reality of Christ. The truth that we cannot handle life on our own. The reality that we don't have to even make that attempt. In God's original design, we were never intended to be strong in ourselves but instead to allow his strength to be evident in us and through us. And when we find it difficult to acknowledge fear, it is because we are still holding on to that concept and that idea that we are the ones who are strong. But the lie makes us ashamed of fear and the shame strengthens the fear and that makes fear deadly. And yet if we will come into the light, if we will step out of the denial, if we will admit our fears, we will find our perfect peace in God through His Son. 366 times in Scripture we are told, do not be afraid. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Certainly Christians can feel fear, but we can make it a springboard for faith. We can recognize fear for what it is, that it is a lie, and we can replace it with the truth of our relationship with Jesus, the very presence of God, the presence of God who lived among us and has promised to someday do it all again as he calls us home to live with him in eternity. A couple of years ago, my son took me on a hike up in the Smokies that was beyond what I could comfortably accomplish. 
The hike was too long and, and the gain in elevation was just too severe for me. And with about two miles left in our return journey, my body began to speak to me. And it was saying the same message over and over again. It was telling me, you're finished. You're done. You can't go on. You can't take another step. I didn't feel like I could, but I also knew that I had no choice. I had to finish that hike. The hike and climb felt like more than I can handle that day. But as I looked at my son, I noticed that it was nothing at all for him. Ryan made the trip up. He made the trip down and, in fact, had made the exact same hike just four days previously. So much of life for me is a lot like that hike. Too much for me, but nothing for my God. As Jesus showed his power over the sea, he is also able to reign over our greatest fears. And now his word proclaims in Revelation 21.1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. We understand exactly, don't we, that the sea was also gone. Someday that dreaded sea, indicative of all of our fears, will be gone for good. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love Jesus because he enables me to overcome my fears.